Welcome to Guernica Edition's Poets Sank Asset interview series, a collaborative project of Canadian poets and independent presses. Guernica Editions is based in Hamilton, which is situated upon the traditional and unceded territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. Today, Caroline Vandermeer and Susan J. Atkinson will be in conversation and will read from their recent poetry collections, and they have a couple poems they wrote just for us. Caroline Vandermeer is a journalist, public relations professional, and university lecturer. She has undergraduate and graduate degrees in literature from University of Ottawa and Concordia University, respectively, and a graduate certificate in creative writing from the Humber School for Writers. She has published articles, essays, short stories, and poems internationally. Her first book, Motherlode, A Mosaic of Dutch Wartime Experience, was published by Wilfrid Laurier University Press in 2014. Her second book, a collection of poetry entitled Journey Woman, was published in 2017 by Toronto-based Inanna Publications. Another collection of poetry, Sensorial, is forthcoming from Inanna in 2021. She lives in Montreal, Quebec. Susan J. Atkinson's poems have won a number of awards, most recently first prize in the 2019 National Capital Writers' Contest and chosen for the shortlist of the 2020 Nick Blatchford Occasional Verse. She has new work in Grain Magazine and The Queen's Quarterly. Her first full-length collection, The Marta Poems, was published by Silver Bow Publishing in 2020, and her chapbook The Birthday Party, The Mariachi Player, and The Tourist is forthcoming with Catkin Press. Visit SusanJAtkinson.com for more information. Hi, Susan. It's very nice to see you. Nice to meet you after reading your fabulous work. I'm really happy to be with you today. Um, to start this conversation about our two collections of poetry, I, I know you mentioned it in your notes that the Marta poems um, was born of an unlikely friendship between you and Marta, but can I ask you how you discovered there was a story to tell? Absolutely. Before I start, likewise, it's wonderful to meet you as well. And uh, um, Marta was actually an elderly neighbor of mine. She just lived a few doors down. Uh, she and her husband uh, had an immaculate lawn, which he was extremely proud of and did not want any of the neighborhood children to uh, be playing on. So often I was shooing my, at the time, two-year-old daughter off the lawn and trying to keep her away from it when one day um, my little wild child, of course, went straight up to the front porch where Marta was actually sitting. And she called me over, beckoned me over, and I thought, oh, no. Oh, I'm going to be in real trouble here. Um, but she didn't. She just started asking me questions about my daughter. She started talking and then she invited us up onto the porch. And I think that in the beginning, she was so interested in my daughter rather than me. And that was where the conversation started. And of course, I'm from England. She'd lived there for a while and it just lent itself to me asking, oh, why were you there? How did you end up there? And everything just started flowing into long afternoons of conversation. And the more stories she gave me, or the more of her background or her journey, the more questions I had for her and the more that I could sort of dig a little deeper. And then when she did finally start talking about her daughter, Irena, that was when there was a poem. That was where the poetic journey began. And uh, I think I was attracted to her just as much as she was to me. And I think it was the fullness of my life. And as a poet looking at her life, it was the emptiness of hers. And I'm guessing that probably your daughter brought back from star some stark memories for her about the loss of her own daughter? And I think I so. I think that it probably was that. Like Tia would at the time would have only been slightly older than her daughter would have been um, when she had passed away. And I think it gave her some comfort. No matter what, we were neighbours. So we were part of the same community. I think we both got a lot out of the relationship. Well, it seems like it was a real relationship of trust for sure. Yeah, it was in the end. 
it was an absolute pleasure and such an honor to uh, read your collection. It, it's wonderful. Uh, I thought to myself when I first got it, oh, I'll just read a couple and then I'll go to bed. I stayed up all night and read the whole thing. Um, <laughs> so my first question is, uh, your wonderful collection of poems is the Chronicle of Marguerite Bourgeois' life. Can you speak a little to the evolution of the work? And did you always have a clear idea of how you wanted it to flow as a whole? Or did it go through lots of different uh, versions and incarnations before you found what you were happy with? Sort of a yes and no mix. So um, I knew that I wanted to write 30 poems. That's the only thing that I knew. Um, I didn't know that I was going to write a bilingual collection. And I didn't know that I was going to write it in first person. That sort of happened. I actually had written, you know, different poems uh, about moments in her life and I hadn't connected anything yet. And I'd written a few of them in third person and I thought, well, it'll be a mix of things. And uh, that didn't feel right to me. As I, as I began to write, I, I started to feel her voice and I, I knew that it had to be first person. But in general about the project, I did know what I wanted to do. And I had the support of the, the, uh, the Notre Dame congregation, which Marie Bourgeois founded. And I did a lot of research uh, in the archives at their mother house here in Mon Montreal. And I actually was also given, they, they were very generous to me. They, they gave me writing space as well. So it kind of put me in the, you know, in a really particular headspace to be in a space that I felt was kind of, if I can say this, blessed by Marguerite herself. So yes, I kind of knew, and yet at the same time, I didn't know how it was going to end up. That's amazing. There's just a couple of things that you said that struck me. First of all, to have the writing space right there, that probably solidified for you wanting to write it in first person, that you were actually in some ways, she was speaking through you or you speaking through her. Um, and also I'm fascinated, 30 poems, was there a reason why you wanted it to be 30 poems? Nope, I don't know why. <laughs> and I kind of with this project felt like, and maybe it was the same for you with Marta's poem, with the Marta poems, but um, I kind of felt like I'm gonna go with my instinct on this. Um, she was a figure who spoke to me in a, in a kind of, um, I just, I just had a lot of respect for her and I realized that she was probably arguably Quebec's first feminist. And I felt like, mm -hmm. you know, she, her life needed to be honored and we'll, we will get to it, I'm sure. But the, the fact that her, the 400th anniversary of her birth, birth was upcoming, that was significant to me. It did feel a little bit like um, she was speaking through me. And I had that sensation in particular when I went to the, uh, Maison Saint-Gabriel, which is the school that she started. Um, oh, wow. the, the building still stands here. And I went to visit it and I, and I was sitting in the parlor before we had our tour. And I, I had this moment where I felt like, oh, I, I, I got the voice, I, I, I got it right. So I, I think you're right. I think that there was some sort of, I don't know, maybe um, dialogue that I was, mm -hmm. feel, I was feeling it. Well, you certainly captured uh, what I would imagine the essence of her voice was. And it struck me many times how it felt like a beautiful, intimate diary that Marguerite had written for her, herself. And that shows just such great skill. I found myself very emotional when I read your work. And especially at the beginning when she was a, a, young, a young girl. And I, and I wanted to ask you, and now that I know that you, you knew Marta personally, she was someone you spoke to regularly, I, I, I'm even more curious. I want to know, um, what was your emotional state as you wrote in the sense that were you, I, you must have felt her deeply because you knew her. And I wonder mm -hmm. if it was difficult for you to actually write her. It's so funny that you should ask um about the emotional side because that there are um obviously in the collection many moments that um are really tug at one's heartstrings um she had a very very desperate life like it was very very difficult um and you know she was always searching for a better life when i was writing 
I felt like I was writing outside of her in a way. And so there was sort of a distance. Um, so my actual emotion didn't really play into it. Um, and even the section, which I find the most difficult to read now um, about her daughter, I think I wrote it almost as if I were her and with that sense of uh, loss and grief and how distraught I would have been if I were her. Yeah. But yet at the same time, I wasn't feeling that when I was writing it, if that makes any sense. But where it does make sense is when the book was first published, I had this great anxiety that there were going to be typos or there was going to be mistakes or I should have had different line breaks or I should have done this or I should have done that, that I didn't let anybody know when it was first published. Um, except for my husband and I spent a few nights reading him the poems out loud. Um, a little at a time, a little at a time, just so I could find tooth comb at first or I could feel comfortable to let it out into the world. And it was when I was reading it that I realized how desperate some of the poems actually sounded. And it sort of surprised me. And I did actually feel <laughs> like crying. And I think it was that everything was like it had been my relationship with her it had been the stories with her and then my interpretation on top of that and they just culminated but it wasn't until i saw them in print i, I can understand what you're saying because i think that we do feel this sort of fear about um before we let something out into the world as you put it there's this this fear of did i get it right um you know and maybe even a little bit of oh, did I miss something? Am I going to make a fool of myself or of, of someone else? This, this, and I, so I totally get that, what you're saying. I think, I think we all feel a bit of that. I know that I have. Um, I, you know, I think it's really interesting that you say that you felt a distance from her because when I read those poems, I didn't feel that distance. I, I, I felt like I was right there. So that that's, um, that's a testimony to, to your ability to bring us so close while you mm -hmm. managed to keep your distance so that you could write it. Thank you. I think that might be part of it, right? Is so that you can just write it um, is somehow, yeah, like keeping that distance. But I also think I, if, I'd have, if I'd have put so much into it, emotionally, I think I would have been afraid that the poems might have sounded more sentimental or more, um, like that they might have lost some of the strength that I hope they have. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that's part of it too. And it's part, probably part of the journey of writing about um, a real person, which is exactly what you yourself would have gone through with Marguerite's story, mm -hmm. is you're writing about a real person. So. Mm -hmm. It's how to find that balance. Hmm. Thank you. How much research went into writing this collection? Was it, and was it important when writing about Marguerite that you remained accurate to her and her life as a historical figure? Or did you leave room for your own imagination and some poetic license? So in terms of the events that are covered in the 30 poems, that is completely accurate. And I, and I really stuck to the history and I, I, I did quite a lot of research. I read a number of books and I, I spent time talking with the foremost scholar on Marie Bourgeois, who's a, a sister actually with the, the Congregation de Notre Dame. Her name is uh, Patricia Simpson. So I spent a lot of time combing through her works in particular. And so I was faithful to the history, but the poetic license, uh, you know, is, it was certainly a big part of it because I, had no idea what way her voice was going to come out. And so I found it really interesting that you said that the voice for you was very consistent. Um, so somehow I, I felt something and I just, I just ran with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's just um, serendipitous I, because, you know, as you will know, you can't plan it. No, but you did, you do. The voice is, it's so beautiful. And, it, and like I say, I think it just reads like her own diary, like her own entries, or if she was speaking. 
um, or as I would imagine her too, which is, I think, probably what you would like your readers to glean from it. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I'm going to read number 28, which is um, actually, for whatever reason, it's one of my favorite ones to read. It's about um, the stable school um, that went up into, into flames. So here we go, number 28. I was offered a stable, not for the birthing of Christ-like babes, but for the education, the molding of fine spirits, of young girls who had fire, but no chance, who were fueled by God's light, but mere girls. Against my better judgment, I took the great building offered me, came away from the stable school, then saw the grandiose classroom burn. His displeasure expressed, wondered if I shouldn't have remained humble in God's brightness, bringing my girls along in modesty. The minute I took more, God admonished me, reproach for yielding to natural impulse, disregard for nonchalance. I self-regulate before my maker, return to teaching in simplicity and poverty, a commitment to remaining small, humble, poor. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, I'm so glad that you read that one. Um, it, it's beautiful and it says so much as well and says so much about how she felt about her vocation. And um, yeah, it's beautiful. I chose to read um, Stepmothers and Breadcrumbs uh, mm -hmm. because I think it gives little way about the story. I'm always worried now when I do a reading that if I choose certain poems, um, I'm giving away a lot. So it's almost like the trailer is actually better than the book. So it's like, if you've heard the, <laughs> you've heard the, <laughs> the little snapshot, why buy the book? So I, I think this one actually does sum up a lot of how Marta felt as well. Stepmothers and breadcrumbs. Marta dreams of being left in the woods where she can walk alone, wander off the path, creep between dark shadows of thick trunks, perhaps stumble upon a sweet cottage with gingerbread siding, and an old witch who would take her in to fatten her up with biscuits dipped in milky white tea. She dreams of feather beds, soft down, tickling cheeks, while she lazes, keeping fat on thin bones, as meal after delicious meal is served by the crone with crooked fingers curved toward the fire. Marta dreams, stirs the fire, damp splinters crackle insults as she moves the pot, hands raw from cold, cinders on fingers, stepmother's breath on her neck no prints in sight. She dreams of being someone, anyone, perhaps even white-skinned, ruby-lipped, biting an apple or sprinkling breadcrumbs on the path, heart cut open by a woodsman. That's amazing, amazing. And what I love about that poem is the, we, we, we hear the echoes of all the fairy tales that you've invoked and, um, mm -hmm. We feel how, um, you know, all of the evil that comes into fairy tales, somehow we, we understand as your, as your story continues that she overcomes that evil. And it, it, yeah. it, you're right. I think it's a beautiful entry into the story that you've chosen. I love that poem. Oh, thank you. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the style that you use to write the collection. So each of the poems is similar aesthetically when you look at the page. And I found that that just brought such a beautiful flow to the work, like it just connected them so nicely. Um, so I wondered why you chose that. And also, I find that it's interesting that you chose not to use any punctuation. And I wondered if you could speak to the poetics of that. I have to tell you that I followed my heart on this. Um, it came out in a rush. A lot of them came out in a rush and it was just what seemed to work. Um, I didn't have an intention for the aesthetic. I do, you're right, it, you know, looking at it as a body of work, it's clear that it's all very similar, but it wasn't like I intended upon that. And as for the punctuation, that's a very interesting point because I did have some punctuation mm. and the editor that I worked with 
Michael Carino, he actually suggested that I remove it all. So I did end up moving some of the things in different, you know, moving some words in lines so that I could, okay. you know, use the end of a line as a comma kind of thing in some yeah. place. So I, I, and I liked once I had done it and, and had a look at it and how it looked and felt, um, it kind of feels exactly what, like what you said, that there was this flow to her. And also there was a kind of calm to her that was kind of consistent. I have this feeling that she was a person who was so solid that she just kind of moved um, in a sort of fluid way throughout her life. And I don't know, maybe that feeling that I had about her is reflected in the poems, but kind of unconsciously. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, from, from hearing you speak today, but also from your notes in the back of the book that you had conversations with Marta about her life and, and most of the stories come from that, but I know you also did research and I'm wondering how long it took you to research. Was the research a very in-depth process for you? And Ultimately, how long did it take you to write this uh, this book? So I met Marta in 2005. Mm -hmm. And um, it was quite soon after that that I started making notes in a journal from the conversations that we had had. And did she and know then that? She did. Okay. She knew how I, I was quite honest with her from the very onset about how intrigued I was. Um, and that the fact that I was poking around so much with the stories was, you know, because I wanted to write about them. Um, no, she really understood that and I'm not 100% clear. <laughs> and she never wanted to see anything. Wow. Even, even after the first two poems were published in Room Magazine way back in 2008, um, she, she didn't want to see anything. As I just mentioned, the first two poems were published in 2008. And then for several years, I just let the poems, uh, I just let the stories just sit in my journal and all the bits and bobs and I did nothing with them. And then occasionally I would pull one up and I would just write a poem that would be what I'd hoped would be a standalone poem. And some of them were published and some of them were not. Uh, but at this point, there was still no real clear direction on what, what I was going to do. Um, and there were so many gaps. In 2016, I had enough poems put together that I, I and funnily enough, I think it was about 30, um, that I was <laughs> able to split the two groups of poems. And I submitted them, one to the Tree Chat Book uh, competition mm -hmm. and to the Gwendolyn McEwen. Uh, Exiles, Gwendolyn McEwen, and both sets of poems uh, were shortlisted. So that was just such a huge boost. It was just that, wow, there is definitely something here, um, but there's a lot missing. I, I, I often felt that, I, I, you know, I had to fill in these holes. And that was when I realized what I really needed was some historical background, like a backdrop, like something that would um, fill all of it in. And this was probably by this point, I'm going to say probably around 2015 or so. And by this point, Marsha had already passed away. So even if I had wanted to get some dates from her or some more concrete details, I couldn't. And it was around this time that strangely enough, another neighbor of mine, her mother um, is Polish and had written a memoir, um, which is, I, I acknowledge in the back of my book. So Marita Bereski had written this beautiful memoir called uh, Roots and Uprooting. And I read it and I had chills because it was so similar to Marta's journey. It was a journey of uh, displacement and loss and, so those, her early, I should, I should say her early life, it was the Polish, the Poland and the Siberia section that I was able to look at Marta's work and get dates that could then lead me to more research mm -hmm. to actually make it accurate. Um, but the funny thing is, I sort of think of the book, if you put it in film terms, as sort of a docudrama. 
-hmm. because you know, it's got these real life events, but I've made up a lot. There's a lot of fiction in that. I guess the, the thing about everything was what I needed to do once I actually read Marisha's book was then cross-reference her dates because of course his was a memoir. So it likely might not have been historically accurate. So then I had to um, cross-reference. Um, but after reading uh, Marisha's memoir, that's when I knew what the, uh, what the book was going to be, the collection was going to be. It was approximately 14 years of on and off writing with a super intense summer of research and edits. <laughs> so this, uh, this poem is, um, it's a re it is in response to uh, life during COVID-19. It was actually a poem that I wrote right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I chose to read this today because I think it does sum up um, how we were feeling way back in those early days, in those early weeks. And it's called April 2020. Spring has slowed, given in to a cold snap. The neighbor's ornamental grass bends with a clumsy nod. Battered from the storm, it clings to gardening string that struggles to hold the bundle together. No one is out today. Too cold to sit six feet apart. The streets rest. Birds cease their idle chatter. The only sound, the scuffle of a broken umbrella bullied by the riffle of breath as the wind slowly dies. Wow. I remember walking home from work the day that things shut down and feeling like it was a ghostly, ghostly world with, with you know, tumbleweeds, uh, in the in the in the deep west or something like that and i think your poem cap captures that thank um, you <laughs> you're welcome so i'm going to read one that actually came up recently um it's called an elderly woman muses on covid confinement and it was inspired in part by a prompt that i received um through through an organization i i i just get random emails from um but this prompt was uh, in response to the book called The Yellow Wallpaper by uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. That short story is about a woman who was given rest cure for hysteria. And mm. she, she was um, basically confined in a old house, a, a lovely old manor house in, in England somewhere. At least I think it was England. And um, she it, it, it literally, from her perspective, she was an intellectual, she's a writer, and from her perspective, it made being, you know, this, this state of hysteria that her husband felt she was in, it made it worse to have mm -hmm. nothing to do. So this, this poem is a kind of mix of a response to that short story and COVID. So here we go. An elderly woman muses on COVID confinement. I couldn't be less free easier to think of it like that than that I am captive. I keep looking out the window, all there is to do really. A bridge that crosses the river, mounts up into a great apex, arcs down the other side, a roller coaster of cars. I wonder what it would be like to be in one of them. Wasn't there a movie, a Volkswagen Beetle with a mind of its own? Yes, I remember now, Herbie. I'd like to be Herbie about now, but my mind is not mine. What there is of it is disjointed. Some days I see a bridge melting into the horizon. Other days a bay with a private wolf, all idyllic and such like. Mysterious deep shaded arbors, riot, riotous old fashioned flowers in the courtyard below my window. But I am not sure anymore what is true. No, I couldn't be less free, so I wait hoping these riotous flowers will bust me out of here so that I can ride Herbie over that inebriated bridge to another consciousness where coronavirus vaccines populate gardens and I am less lonely. Yeah, again, it just, it captures those moments that we're in. And I, I appreciate that you um, mentioned what it was in response to, and which is fascinating. Now, you know, I want to read the story as well. I love your line, riotous flowers. Like... Oh, I need to say that that's not mine. That actually comes from the short stories. So back to our book discussion, we've both 
taken a look at history and, mm -hmm. and our, our, our characters are historical. Um, would you call yourself a historical poet, do you think? No. Okay. No. I think I would like to think of myself um, as, a, as a storyteller. Okay. I think that I used history as a backdrop for her story. And um, at the heart of everything is the story of an ordinary woman who in the end lived quite an extraordinary life mm -hmm. as a displaced person, as a refugee, the journey that she had to take, the struggles that she met and how she always uh, rose to them um, with that sense of this is the way it is. This is just what you do. This is what life is. I, I think the elements of history that I have in there, uh, like the work camps or um, the plight of the refugees and, and of course the war itself. Um, and also, you know, the needing to leave Rhodesia or any of those um, particular historical moments. I think they, I, I'm only using them because they are adding some fabric. Uh, for Marta's life. You know, I wish she could hear me. I think Marta was probably a really great storyteller. Mm. I think she probably really was. She didn't give me the dates, but she could give me enough um, that, uh, that I could look some other things up. So I think so, she probably was a great storyteller. So one of my favorite things about your work was the word cinnamon. Oh! So you used the word cinnamon to describe the skin. This is for our, our listeners or watchers today. The skin of the man she fell in love with in Rhodesia. Yes. Can I tell you, like, now I'm going to tell you, this is like the honest truth part. The whole Rhodesia section is completely fiction. So um, Marta, uh, Marta went to Rhodesia. No, it's not completely fiction. She went to Rhodesia and I had a very rough idea of the dates that she went. Um, and the only tidbit that she gave me was that um, because she was an expert sewer, an expert tailor, she was actually given preferential treatment in the work camp. Um, and she had better living conditions, say, than some other of the refugees or displaced people. Um, but I know nothing else. Um, but I felt like it was such an important part of her life to be in Rhodesia. And I only knew Marta um, as an elderly lady. And I also knew her as having what seemed like quite a unhappy, a perhaps limited, slightly miserable existence um, in her latter years. And she'd suffered so much loss that I thought she needed a great love affair. She should have something great. So I gave her Rhodesia and I gave her a man with cinnamon colored skin. And I really hope that she would have approved and she would have loved him. <laughs> what a beautiful, beautiful, generous gift to give her. Seriously. And, and, and you know, I, I feel as much as you say that that section is fiction, I feel that that was where Marta became Marta. Mm. Wow, thank you. <laughs> I think she would have loved it. Um, in the preface, you mentioned that April 20th was the 400th anniversary of Marguerite's birth. And so my first part of the question is, how long ago did you start the manuscript? And was that fact about the anniversary always in the back of your mind? And then with that, was there any pressure once you'd finished the manuscript and perhaps the edits and then submitted it to a publisher. And of course, we all know that it takes time for publishers to get back and then other edits. Was there a pressure that it needed to be finished and out by 2020 so it would coincide with that anniversary? Good questions. Very, and, and relevant, really relevant because, well, absolutely. So I started thinking about this and I, I think, you know, it'll it's a bit shocking probably because it took me a lot less time to write this than it's taken me to write other things. 
but I started thinking about this in October 2018. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I reached out, out of the blue, I was on a business trip and it kind of dawned on me that I wanted to do this and kind of been percolating in my mind because I live not far from the chapel that is the Marie Bourgeois Chapel. It's the, the place where she, she and her congregation built the first church in Montreal. Of course, it's not the original church anymore. This church um, was uh, re-erected. So I would walk by that uh, church on my way to work every day. And it just kind of got stuck in my head. So anyway, after when I finally decided I wanted to do something, I actually reached out to the scholar, Patricia, Patricia Simpson, who I mentioned earlier, and uh, asked her if she knew if there was a way that I could be granted access to the archives at, at, uh, in the, at the congregation. And um, she, to my surprise, she answered relatively quickly and said, well, oh, yes, I can actually, I can help you arrange this. So that's how it began. And I, and I had a meeting with the chief archivist who introduced me to a sister who, um, whose name is also Marguerite, uh, who is uh, in her early eighties now. And she became my guide. And she introduced me to the archives, gave me material. At some point or other said to me, you're a busy person. You should come here and write. It will give you the peace you need to concentrate. So that was her idea. So yes, uh, the 2020 anniversary was always in my mind. And I had no idea how I was going to make this happen. I, I absolutely wanted it to be published in 2020 because mm -hmm. I wanted it to be part of the Congregation celebrations. To be honest with you, Susan, it was a bit of a serendipitous pro process the whole way along. I, I sort of just had faith. I don't know. It just, it just worked. All right. So it took you 14 years to write this book, mm -hmm. get this book published, right? Am I right on the number of years? Yes. So yeah. you, you said that, um, you know, you said in your short answer to the to the question, you said uh, basically I, it was it took me fourteen years, and I, I it was like a bit of writing here. There were spurts, right? Yeah. Um, is that would you say that that is your creative process that you write in spurts or not typically? No, it's not typically how I how I write. I think the reason um, I worked on this for so long was because. Uh, it took me a long time to decide how I wanted it to be a collection. So some of the standalone poems, like some of the poems that have been published in journals or um, have been published as suites, um, those all happen very quickly. My usual process is that I will, I tend to see a scene. I tend to, yeah, I see what it is that I want to write about and then I just put myself in there and, sort of act my way through it and write everything down all in one flourish. Um, and usually those are the poems that I like the most. And those are usually the poems that I don't tend to go back and rework and rework. And they are the ones that usually end up being in print, which is, which is sort of strange. Um, and then it's the poems that, you know, I, maybe take a long time over or a half finished in my journal that I think, oh, you know, there's quite a nice thread there. There's quite a nice line. I think I'll go back. I might reuse that. Those are the ones that tend to not see the light of day. Those, like you say, those are the ones, I think maybe because we've brought it to bear with our whole bodies and souls and it, it comes out almost perfectly birthed. And mm -hmm. the ones that we have to struggle with, uh, they, they just weren't, perfectly formed to start with and and they're troubled I don't know yeah I tend to find that and it's so funny and I think it's because it needs to be so visceral and if I feel that then I can it just happens the creative process is somewhat um it's erratic in a way right because sometimes mm -hmm. it works one way and sometimes it works another and it's really hard to know in advance what that's going to be uh, you have obviously been very, very busy. I'm wondering if you have any other projects on the back burner, or if you would just like to speak a little bit about your upcoming collection, which is super exciting. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the one that's coming out. It's called Sensorial. It's about sensory perception and, 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 mm -hmm. and it's about feeling. 
So I tend to organize my poems around events and, and, and people and places. So I think um, it's a collection that responds to any one of those things, but um, looks at our sensory reactions to them. And um, I just managed to sort of call together a fifth, a fifth, a fifth collection also, wow. which I haven't really started, you know, really working on the editing yet, but I, all the poems are organized and um, the working title is Other Stories. And we'll see where that goes. And, you know, I've been telling people for many years that I've been working on a children's novel and that's as much as I'll say about that because it never seems to get anywhere. <laughs> but there's hope that I'll, I'll move it along this year. Oh, so that's, that's fantastic. Uh, and you? Uh, actually, it's funny. I have a chat book that is, and it's really uh, final. Fi I think it's actually gone to the printer. Um, it's Lovely. coming out uh, with Catkin Press. Mm -hmm. And it is um, called The Birthday Party, The Mariachi Player, and The Tourist. Yeah. And it's uh, eight... And, sorry, 17 poems that each are made up of seven couplets. And there is a uh, refrain that pulls all of them together throughout. And along the bottom of the, each page is um, a line from a well-known mariachi song. And the poems actually chronicle one night. So Sounds they're quite sensual. So when is it going to come out? Because I, I it's can't very wait to... soon. I think I think that it's going to be out like maybe February. But um, wonderful, yeah, which is great. And I have like another chat book in in the works. And so I'm kind of thinking 2021 might be the year of the chat book. So I want to say thank you to you, Carolyn. This has been so delightful. Uh, I want to really thank my publisher, Silver Bow Publishing, Candice James, who really took a chance on my manuscript and she turned it into this beautiful book. So thank you to Candice. And I'll add to that and say, Susan, this has been a total delight. And I feel like we've got some more conversations to have offline and I look forward to those. And obviously a little shout out, actually a big one to the Congregation de Notre Dame and uh, the women who are behind it and um, enable Marie Bourgeois to, to come alive. Stay tuned for our next interview next week. Don't forget to like and subscribe.